Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half. Tonight's second half is an interview that you will not soon forget. The gentleman that I'm going to introduce you to has been studying cryptids, researching cryptids while working for NASA for decades. Um, there is no expert in cryptozoology, but if there were, it would be this man. Before we get into this interview, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman, Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things, they really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with tonight's tonight's interview, shall we? So tonight I have Mr. Tim Kunbo Baker. Tim, how are you tonight? Doing very well, thank you. Thank you for finding some time out of your busy schedule. I know you're a busy guy, so I really appreciate this. Yeah, um, no problem. <laughs> I know um, we're not. We really don't have kind of a plan of what's going to be tonight. We got a couple of things that we want to talk about. Um, I think we'll just dive right into it. What, what you addressed when we first started the conversation off with, and I'll put the picture in the video so you guys can see it. Um, yeah. someone sent me a picture of supposedly the crime scene at the LBL and I shared it with you a while back and, um, uh -huh. to get your input on it. So. And then your input was what, sir? Well, I looked it over pretty good, and um, it looked real familiar with to me because um, uh, growing up, one of my friend's parents had an old Winnebago RV, and this thing looked like it. So I got to digging around, and I figured out that the the RV that's in that picture that you sent me is a around a 70, 1973-1974. Winnebago Indian D-22, and I was able to scale off of it and, uh, and nail down the exact model by the windows and the distance from the little uh, little overhead vent door uh, to the main door and, and the location of a little uh, light beside the door. There were several things in the picture where I was able to nail down the exact model that it was. Okay. And that tells me that this is not the not the RV that was involved in the LBL um, a dogman attack that happened in in the around the mid 80s, uh, around 83, 84, 85 time frame. Okay. Um, the uh, I know that the people that, uh, that that were killed then they were pretty well to do, and they had a had a uh, uh, according to you know my friend uh, who was a ranger there and uh, in LBL uh, uh, back during the, the 90s and and uh, and later until he retired uh, that he uh, uh, that the, the people were well well to do and they had a you know a very a new very modern RV uh, of the day which you know would have been like I said, some it would have been a at least a ten year newer model, mm -hmm. and if you, and even supposing that it was a Winnebago, uh, uh, even still that brand, if you go and look at the at Winnebagos from that time period, from the uh, early to mid eighties, that's a they are way different looking than the one that's in the picture, right? And 
And another thing too in the picture, the um, the the text that's on there where it says evidence photo across the bottom, mm -hmm. that has been uh, photoshopped on there, or or you know some kind of somebody's done that on a computer that wasn't actually written on there. Okay. Uh, that was uh, that was not written on the pho photo itself. Um, now that is an old. Uh, the photo is, or is made to look like a uh, an old Polaroid, you know, color right, right. picture. So um, <clears throat> you know, and I don't. It may there may be a a, de a dead body that lay in there. I mean, that <laughs> may may not have been photoshopped in. That might be an an authentic crime scene photo. Right, right. But it's but it's not from the incident. The famous incident in the LBL. Yeah, I can tell you that. And that that encounter is, you know, so famous. But there's so many uh -huh. different like stories and variations of the stories. And oh know, lord, yeah. It, <laughs> I mean, I could count on both hands and still, you know, use a couple toes. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times I've heard different variations of that story? So, mm -hmm. Right. You know, it just. And you know, as as many times as I have been been up there, there are still some things that I want to investigate, and some places that I want to go um, there. If I can, you know, find some other, you know, a couple of other good researchers that got the uh, got the guts to go in there with me. <laughs> I mean, I know a, I know a, a few. We just we just hadn't uh, gotten uh, the chance to do it because. You know, every time we go in there, we learn something. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and what is so funny is I heard, a, I got a phone call from someone here not long ago, and they were saying that uh, that this person had, had uh, you know, told, said that, that, uh, <laughs> that oh, there wasn't ever an RV park there and all this kind of stuff. Well, let me tell you, I can take you in there. I can show you where where each one of the, uh, the the slots were or the, the spaces were, I can show you. The corner stakes are still there. The plumbing is still there. The power cables are still there. I mean, it's 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 extremely evident, right. if you know what to look for, where the park was. Yeah, I mean, and Mother you, Nature and is going to reclaim it, so there's going to be you yeah. know, evidence there. You just got to look. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so... That's uh, and I've taken. There's a lot of people out there that that have that I have taken in there, you know, myself personally. That and you know, even though even the ones that are somewhat doubters, once I showed them, uh, you know, showed them the place, they're like, "Whoa, okay, yeah, definitely, this is definitely an RV park, you know, an RV campground." Right. Right. But, was there uh, electric like electrical hookups yep. back then in there? Yep, okay. sure were. There was electrical and water. Yeah, so I mean, there's going to be, like you said, yeah. corner markers and stuff like that. Evan, right. You know, just... exactly. And there were there were bathhouses. There were bath out multiple bathhouses in there. And uh, now, I will give you the the, the place is pretty. Uh, part of the place is pretty rugged for an RV park. I'd hate to try to. Uh, uh, I don't know. I guess the road was in a lot better shape then, but. Uh, with the, the large RVs now that they make now would have a hard time negotiating uh, the eastern end of the park. Okay. So there were some pretty steep hills in there. However, the people who, the family that got killed, they did not go down in that part of the park. They were up, they were up near the top part of it. Okay. You know, where it was, uh, and they were in a, um, the slot that they were in, or the, or the spot that they were in, was um, it was um, if you came in at the angle that the thing was built, it was fairly level. It was a good, it was a good spot. I could very easily, even today, uh, get my get my RV in there, hmm. and, right. and I've and I and I I don't. I, in fact, even I could even get my old one in there. I used to have a thirty four foot fifth wheel, and. Uh, and I've downsized, and uh, I've got a 24-foot uh, bumper pull now. But I could, I could have gotten either one of them in there easier. I mean, easily. And um, hell, my sister and brother-in-law, I might be able to, even to get their big, their big bus in there. <laughs> but, 
That's yeah. funny. Well, <laughs> you've got one, you've got one, uh, you know, one volunteer right here. I'll, I'll drive south <laughs> and meet you if you ever want to go. So, um, uh -huh. there's a lot of, you know, uh, speculation and questions, um, because, you know, a lot of people that are into cryptozoology don't, don't uh -huh. have the, you know, time, money, or like you said, courage to go into those woods. Um, uh -huh. and there's that abandoned, what I guess they call Hotel California out there. What is that supposed to be that? Oh, it was, it was a, it was a really, really nice private home. I mean, I've been in there. I've walked all through it. Most of it's been, it's been, they've torn, they've torn down most of it now. Okay. And, but it was, it was a really nice, um, home there by near the waterfront, um, on the, uh, in the Northeast part of the, of the park. Okay. And, uh, of course, they, you know, they they bought everybody. The, the government, when they when they developed LBL back in the nineteen early nineteen sixties, they bought out all the the, the property you know, and uh, condemned everybody's property, paid them for it, and they had to leave. So they, you know, there were lots of homes that were just walked away from. Mm. And this was was a very you know really fancy place and. Um, and it was big, and the people that owned it, you know, they obviously, they liked to party and stuff, and, you know, there was a lot of room in it. That's how I kind of got the name Hotel California. Okay. And it looked out, it looked out over Lake Barkley. Yeah. And um, so, uh, and it, it was big enough that <laughs> when you when you pulled into the driveway of the place, there was a, uh, uh, people say it was, it's called a bunker. No, it's not a bunker. There was a nice, big concrete block or brick a uh, well house there <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's all it was was a well house and and then uh, you went past the well house and you drove down to that to the to the house of course that's all that all that's blocked off now but it's been so disfigured and torn up and parts of it torn down and and stuff over the years that it's uh it's, it's changed a lot and uh you know, and of course, kids get in there and they spray paint all kind of crazy stuff all over it. And, mm -hmm. you know, they try to make it look like some kind of a horror place or mm -hmm. devil worshippers uh, place. And But there's really, uh, no, nah, it, it does attract a lot of crazy people. So, you know, I personally wouldn't go down there uh, by myself right. unarmed. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been down there by myself before, but, uh, but like I said, I was uh, uh, was was properly armed, and uh, and I'm not advocating going out into uh, on national recreation areas, toting guns all over the place. You know? No, absolutely. Uh, but uh, but like I said, there there is a crazy element that that likes to hang out down there now. I'll, I'll tell you that. And I have not uh, the last time I went. Went there. There was a lot more of it left than than what there is now. I've seen more recent pictures, and there's they've torn down most of the second story of the place. It's, it's gone, and a lot of the and and parts of the uh, lower level of it are are pretty much destroyed. Right. But but there's enough of it left that you know that there was something there, or something pretty impressive there at one time. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it's just a. It was a, it was a hangout for years, just where people, you know, the locals, kids, and stuff like that. People go there and and hang out or camp out there, spend the night there, you know, sit around, drink beer, build a campfire, that kind of stuff. But then, you know, they got a crazy element that started going there, trying to make something else out of it. But, right, right. Um, but I can tell you this: I've never had any bigfoot activity anywhere around it, anywhere right. near it. Right. And uh, <clears throat> but um, no, uh, that place is steeped with just urban legend. You know, and I think a lot right. of it, like when you just stated that the military purchased it, and I think in like 63 or somewhere around there, um, mm -hmm. what was the purpose of the, the purchase? Was it to turn it into a preserve or? 
Well, they were, yeah, they were going to turn it into a national recreation area. Okay. And, I mean, to, I guess the purpose of it was to do turn it into what it is today. Now, there was an area there in the north end where there was a National Guard uh, training area. It's what I understand, was told that it used to be, and I've been in it. And there are some bunkers. There, Excuse me, there were some bunkers, but this is miles away from what they call the Hotel California, or the or the the Devil the Devil Inn or Devil's Inn or whatever they I've heard other people call it. Right. But it's it's miles from that. But there was a a bunker area that uh, and it was and the bunkers were arranged so they had overlapping fields of fire, and they weren't built to kill the that. Some people say, oh, they were they they built them when they were trying to hunt down all the all the dog men and, and kill them so they get them on overlapping fields of fire. No, they were not. They Those things were there since the 1950s okay. and, uh, or, or early 60s. Um, they, and, I, and I've, I've seen them, I've been in them, but they're gone now. They came in there, there was so much crap going on again with those things, people coming in there that they, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, something like that, they got in there and they, I guess they got in there with big dozers or huge big track hoes or whatever. And the last time I walked, went up in there, you had to you had to park and then uh, walk up an old road bed, had a cable across the road, and I walked up in there and um, and there were just, you know, there were, you could see where the place had been torn up and the remains of the thing, the big chunks of concrete were just in pile, two or three, you know, big old piles up there uh, in the area, right? And it was all grown. And it was all grown up and, and everything. And um, I, the last time I was there at, at LBL, I, I um, went up in there, and uh, unfortunately, it was on up like on up in the late spring, and the, everything was greened up good, and the ticks and the bugs and the chiggers and stuff were out. And I went up to the old road that went up in that area, and it was grown up you know, knee deep and, and, and weeds and stuff. And, and I didn't have a 55 gallon drum of insect repellent to, to bathe in <laughs> before I went up there. <laughs> and so I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't walk up, walk up to the old place and look at it again. All right. But, uh, uh, me and Chiggers don't get along too, too well. Yeah, Chiggers and I don't get along too well. <laughs> I don't think they get along too well with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's definitely an interesting place. It's it it'll be <clears throat> you know, that <clears throat> excuse me, that terrible event will always be remembered and uh right. you know, there'll always be speculation and stories, you know, un untrue mm -hmm. or true surrounding mm -hmm. that area. Um Right. So um the other day, uh Getting, staying off or getting off the, that place, moving on to a different place. I had mm -hmm. done a upload uh, about my neck of the woods, and I had talked about it with you. Um, the 1976 Goslin uh, experience in White Hall, New York, uh, where the right. uh, White Hall police officer his, and his little brother all saw a sasquatch um did you have you ever gotten a chance to come up here and and check out anything up here of, in regards to well that? it it's been years ago the last time i was up in that area was would have been in um up there actually researching uh bigfoot would have been in the uh early 90s okay and uh and i i spent most of my time in um uh, the bennington triangle area uh, uh, New Hampshire and up along the uh, the east side of uh, Lake Champlain and up towards Green Mountain and that area and um, and then I went up and up through Maine on a three day weekend and um, that we had and I took out and I went went way up by myself way up on a bunch of the logging roads in Maine. And went all the way up to the Canadian border, uh, to a little town that uh, 
supposedly uh, the Beatles met up there. That there, there's a little tavern up there where the the border between the USA and Canada goes right through it. Okay. And they actually painted on the floor. And one of the Beatles couldn't come into the U.S. or he was going to be arrested, and another one couldn't go out of the U.S. or he wouldn't be allowed to come back or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm not. I can't remember the Beatles' history, but they met there in this little tavern. Okay. And I and I I talked to some of the folks that I worked with up there in New Hampshire, and they uh, told me how to, you know, where the place was, and I figured out how to get there. And I took off on a three-day week and rode, drove all over the place up in there. Went, went up to, um, oh, what is that uh, big uh, state park? Baxter, okay. Baxter Mountain. Went up through Baxter Mountain State Park up in Maine. and. Yep. And uh, went through some really, really remote areas. And I came back to work Tuesday. I was I was doing a bunch of work at uh, on the uh, reactor control system at Seabrook Nuclear Plant up there on the coast of New Hampshire at the time. That's why I was up there. And um, anyway, when I got back to work Tuesday morning and, and I was telling the guys where I went and what I did, they all looked at me like I was crazy. And one of the guys said, you are an idiot. You went up there by yourself? Yeah. They said, you were, and they got telling me, and all the people that disappeared up there, and, and that you, you break down and you, you, know, you starve to death before anybody find you, and all kind of crap. And, you know, well, I had taken plenty of food and some supplies and stuff with me. But they are correct. Yeah. One day I drove all day, all day, and never saw another car, never saw another human being. That was weird. Yeah, it is <laughs> weird. It's, it's a very, I, to have family and that live up there in northern Maine, not just like York, like when you enter Maine, um, mm -hmm. like close to Acadia National Park. And um, right, I have uh, my aunt is friends with a guy who lives up in Lubeck, which is close to the Canadian border. And there are puffins that literally walk around the, the roads out there in population mm -hmm. like 100. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a very beautiful, but very secluded area and prime, prime yeah. location for, for Sasquatch. Definitely. Yeah. Well, the only thing I saw, <laughs> and I stopped several places and I called and, and, um, I, uh, I actually spent one night there in, in, uh, Baxter Mountain State Park. And, uh, but I got out and I, I called and, and everything. And I never got never got even the slightest kind of an answer and uh, I never saw any evidence never saw any sign um, and I was, I was sort of disappointed to tell you the truth <laughs> but, but um, uh, it was uh, it was still a beautiful country Very, really interesting it was amazing some of those roads how many miles you'd have to drive to get around one lake yeah um, that, that that was but uh, I drove up to, uh, on the way up, up there, um, let me see here, I'm digging out one of my old maps here, let me see, I'm trying to light here so I can read it. Um, uh, yeah, there's Baxter Mountain. I drove all the way up to, uh, like, uh, Millinocket, I think that's the name of the place. Okay. And the, the first day I, I left out down, um, I left out from Seabrook and drove all the way up uh, and made it all the way to Baxter State Park uh, that evening and uh, camped up there. And um, then uh, left there and drove around. Of course, a lot of, this, a lot of these roads are just logging roads, mm -hmm. and they're, they're closed a large part of the year. And I came up on several places. Uh, you know, I'd managed to get a hold of uh, some halfway decent maps but there were a number of the roads i tried to try to use that, that were closed and and uh you know it was it was old it was this is back map and compass days you know and i, I did a lot of uh navigating via uh map and compass but man i saw some beautiful country yeah and uh and what was weird i didn't see a single bear not one and i only saw one moose hmm. um <laughs> and uh, I remember the the uh, 
<laughs> um, I was in a little old rent. I was in a rental car <laughs> that had a uh, like Florida plates on it or some kind of bullshit like that. I'd rented the thing and. <laughs> In Boston, but it had, I think it had like Florida plates or Georgia plates or something on it. And on the way back on Monday, I was coming, I was in the freaking middle of nowhere, and I was on this road that kept going around these, in amongst these big these lakes. And I got to a point where I was afraid I was going to have to be driving through water, <laughs> but the road was just this gravel road was just just barely, barely above the water level of the lake. I didn't I got out and walked over it and make sure it was, you know, solid enough to support the car and then it was really the road. So I drive and it turned out it was and I got across it and I came around a little curve and there was an old beat up like a Toyota Land Cruiser sitting there and there was this old fella out there and he was like I said, I'm sixty five now <laughs> at the time I was thinking uh, you know, an old fart, you know, he was 65 or 70 years old. He was about the age I am now. And he was out there fishing. And I pulled over and, and uh, the guy looked around and he saw those plates on my car. He said, buddy, are you lost? <laughs> 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 and, and uh, man, I was wishing I had a uh, rod and reel with me because he was, he was catching some uh, nice trout yeah, uh, on a spinning, on a spinning reel. Yeah. rather than a fly rod beautiful sportsman uh, you know it's a perfect sportsman uh paradise yeah. out there so mm -hmm. yeah but but you know talking about exploring and uh, you know researching in that area uh i uh had had seen reports and stuff and heard about the stuff going on over there in uh in new hampshire and stuff around the bennington area and you know even even back in the 90s i was i was hearing about that from different people and um uh, so i took off over in that area and i now i had never heard the term bennington triangle at that time okay. i just knew that bennington was a was a weird was a weird place and um and that there was a lot of stuff there'd been a fair amount of sightings and stuff in the area and um and that there were weird things supposedly a lot of ufo sightings and things and um, I drove over there, and I um, drove into the into the town, and and we just went riding around, ex exploring around. I was trying to find a road that uh, that a, a fella had had told me about, and he had given me a pretty good description of it. And uh, I was supposed to look for this one particular old abandoned building, and then turn just east of that building sort of to the northeast and follow a, a creek bed or follow a, a, the road went along the west side of a creek and I found it and so I I'm driving up through there and he had told me he said the really weird thing about it was that um that there were these really nice beautiful homes along this road that it looked like the people had just picked up and walked out of and that there were furniture still in them and all this. They were still furnished, but nobody had been in them for decades. And I found two or three of those, those little homes like that. And I drove up in the driveway of one of them and I uh, got out and looked and what was crazy, they hadn't been vandalized or anything, but you could, you know, I, I was able to look through the windows and, uh, so a few of the windows in the place was completely furnished, beautiful furniture and everything. And I, I was just astounded that the place wasn't, that they weren't vandalized. Yeah. And they were, they were still locked up tight. Now this is in, this would have been in around 19, uh, around 93, 94 time, time frame. And, um, I, uh, uh, then there was a house next door to it that uh, I actually had to, had driven past it before I turned up the driveway of the one that, that I first you know stopped at. So I walked through a bunch of weeds and stuff and uh, after spraying down good with a uh, with a uh, with DEET um, with a good musk muscal insect repellent that uh, y'all that y'all have up there that we can't get down here. Yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I walked over to it, and it was uh, uh, it was empty. And there was nobody there, but it was you know, fairly empty. But it was it was it was a nice house too, and it was just really surprising that, that there was nobody living up there. The road went on beyond that, and I started up through there, and uh, there were some houses up in uh, at least one that I saw. It was back off the road a little ways, and it looked like something out of a horror movie. All these trees and brush growing up around it. And I stopped, and I was going to get get out and go up there, and I'm thinking, well, I'm by myself. I don't have a – I'm not armed. <laughs> and uh, I just got a real creepy feeling, so I uh, got back in the car, and I tried to go on up further, and the road just sort of petered out. It got, it got pretty rough. It hadn't – been maintained or anything and looked like the only thing been up through there were maybe jeeps and trucks and maybe dirt bikes or something but uh it was not good to drive up no, but definitely. <laughs> yeah but i'll say this i'm trying to find on the map <clears throat> where, what the name of the place was uh yeah, damn it um uh I went through Bennington, and there is a there is a mountain out north of town that's supposedly where a bunch of UFO activity yep. went up, went on. I stayed in a little town past Bennington, out to the west, and I don't remember the name of it. Um, let's see, I think it's Arlington. Yeah. West. Uh, and I just this this is such a bad map that I have here that I can't I can't even find Bennington on it. Um, I got Manchester, Concord. Uh, anyway, I stayed in a little town out on the other side of Bennington, out to the west or sort of northwest. And I went out that night, rooting around. And I will say this, up. On Bennington Mountain, up at the top, I couldn't see it directly, but there were a bunch of lights up there, a bunch of flashing lights. They were like flashing up in there. It almost looked like somebody was welding, and there were all these you know, flashes of light coming up out of the trees up towards the top of the mountain. Now, I'm not saying I didn't see anything, any, anything moving or anything like that, uh, any kind of spacecraft there or anything like that. It could have been just kids up there four wheel driving and and you know going up on up and down over the rocks and all the you know they had all these you know souped up uh, lights and stuff on them. Those could have been just flashing up there. That, that's what I figured it was, but there was definitely something going on up on that mountain. I'll say that. That's uh, but I did not have, I did not feel that it was UFOs or anything like that, and. I have spent some time up there actually, you know, rooting around and doing some calling and stuff like that. Again, no response whatsoever. Okay. And I went up to, I had read a bunch of stuff about, and uh, heard several things about sightings up around Green Mountain in Vermont. And I went up there one weekend, spent, spent a couple of days up, up in that area. Again, never found a thing. Uh, I did. I did talk to a couple of people though that were from up there. I made contact with a guy, and he he took me out and showed me where he'd had an encounter, and uh, around on the north side of uh, of, uh, of Green Mountain, and um, and it was definitely boogery looking country, and and it was the right kind of habitat, and I have no doubt that that the place. Uh, I'm sure that the place. If if there were any in there, that'd be a good place for them. Okay. Um, yeah, that was they'd be they'd be quite at home there. <laughs> but um, they uh, they uh, but I just didn't you know I didn't I didn't find any evidence, no tracks or anything like that. Didn't hear anything. You know, spend a spend a night up there one night uh, out, and I just. Uh, but those woods are so, the woods and everything are so vast up there Yeah. that you just have to be at the right place at the right time to stumble across them. Yeah. And, um, 
and it's a different kind of woods up here, you know, yeah. than other parts yeah. of the country. It's just a very dense, multi, uh, different and, varieties and of trees and just right. you know, hills, rocks. It's just, it's a very... Extremely rough. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 get off, you get off the beaten path and, and it, it'll take you 45 minutes to go 150 yards. Yep. That stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable. And just sure, you know, you go walking straight yeah. and you go up a hill and there's just yeah. sheer drops, you know, from where the mountain right. is cracked. Exactly. And it's it's definitely a rough, rough land up here. But beautiful. Yeah, ex- exceedingly rough. <laughs> yeah. I, that's what that's what really surprised me. Now, and it was a totally different Maine wasn't near as rough yeah. as 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 northern Vermont as Vermont and and New Hampshire, uh, they were much 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 rougher country, and woods you know were way more dense than I had expected them to be, and I was uh you know and, and just because I didn't find anything at the time doesn't mean they they're, that they're not up there. I mean that place could uh, you could hide a hundred thousand of them in there and. And if they wanted, to, didn't want to, anybody see them, they wouldn't get seen. Right. Now, when you were uh, calling them, were you using? You were just using your call, or were you using? Yeah, that just phone? just my mouth. Yeah, just just using regular calls that, that I've taught myself over the years. When did you say? I'd, I'd, I'd love, to, I'd love to go back up there and use some of the methods that I that I've got now. Yeah. Well, you know, anytime you want, I've got a I've got an mm-hmm. extra room here for you. You can more than welcome to stay. Yeah. and We'll go up there. When did you start using your new that new method? The uh, where you kind of started the the Jewish horn or whatever thing that you were talking about yeah. last time. Yeah. When did when did I start doing that? Yeah. Oh, uh, about three years, three four, about three or four. We've been playing around with the idea. I mean, we've been studying this for for years. Okay. And and I'm not the one that came up with this. Uh, Mark Maycheck is is the, the brains behind this, and um. He's he's had this idea and been studying it for years, way ahead of before anybody else even dreamed of it. Right. And um, and uh, he's an exceedingly uh, sharp guy. Um, and he got to telling me about it, and I got and I studied, you know, got to studying about it, and and uh, and I was very very intrigued, and uh, I decided. Well, if you know, in fact, he he's first said it. He said, "If we could get our hands on one of these, and um, if and if we do it, if we can figure out the right way to do it," he said, "They'll get results if these things are what we think they are. You know, that, that they are somehow connected to the nephilim." Right. And so, uh, and so, I got to looking around, and, and lo and behold, my wife found one. <laughs> <laughs> in a in an antique shop. That's awesome. And I bought it, <laughs> and and the, the rest is history. And I it, it took me it took me a year to learn how to blow the thing correctly. Okay. It took a a year, and um, it and, and I mean times that I was getting blood blisters on my lips, <laughs> you know. To, uh, and it's a wonder I hadn't got emphysema because that thing they are it is not easy. You're not going to just pick one up and and uh and and mess with it for an hour and and do anything that'll that'll bring a bigfoot running. Right. And another thing too, we still don't know how safe this is. Yeah. The, the times that I've been able to do it, get it right, they did come charging in, and they they come running in hard and fast until they get to the point where they can lay eyeballs on you, and then they just slam on the brakes and stop, and just stand there and watch you. And, um, but I just, you know, you know, there's no way that I'll go go out doing the thing, you know, by myself because I, you know, we don't know what'll happen if you get a hold of a bad one. Right. Uh, and I mean, we had one come up behind us. We were, we were up on the Mississippi river and, there's an island, a particular island up there that, that I've been hearing about uh, a lot of activity on this island and the river. I've been hearing about this since back in the uh, in the 90s. And um, 
so we got up there and we were we managed to get around and find a, a road that went down got us to the waterfront and we were underneath a big high bank uh, a bank about 12 feet tall and I thought well this is great because that'll sort of reflect the sound over there whatever sound that we can get it's going to make it it's going to throw it really good out all the way across the river and um, so uh, I managed to get a couple of good blasts out of the thing and and uh, uh, you know the right frequency and everything and the next thing we know, we hear something behind us and look. And I mean, right up above us. We were right at the base of this bank. And I'm there, standing there at the top of the bank. There was one standing there looking down on us. Absolutely scared the crap out of us. But it was just standing there looking at us. Wow. It didn't It didn't growl at us. It didn't do anything. It just it looked at us a little bit and it just turned around and walked away. And, uh, of course, there we were with no damn cameras right. or anything. And... Uh, uh, so is that uh, where the the whole background of that horn came from? Um, Mark kind of like used the biblical sense of. Yep. Okay. Yep. And it took me, and then I spent a good bit of time talking with uh, um, some serious um, scholars of um, Jewish scholars, and one of them was actually. Uh, he was presented to me as a uh, by other people as a Jewish mystic, okay. and he's the one that really gave me enough information. Or, uh, I, he didn't just give it to me; I had to work for it. But he <laughs> gave me enough clues that I found that was able to find the information and and do some experimentation and figure out how to make it work. And uh, but it it took. Even after I had the thing in my hands, it took over a year to uh, to figure out how to use it and make it work. Okay. And uh, yeah, and I, the the first time that it ever worked was up in was up in Iowa, and that I was able to do it right. And this is a place that I'd been, and I'd been calling and calling, trying to blow that damn thing. There's a place that where I had gotten run out of before in, in the years previous so i knew they were in there and uh but i had been there several times so they knew me so you know it's like i tell people if you go into an area where where they haven't been messed with much and you do a good call you know you're going to get the attention of the alpha he's going to say who the heck who the heck is this intruder in on my territory and Mr. Big Boy himself is going to come see see what the hell is going on, and he's going to set you straight that, that that's his territory. Well, that happened to me the very first time that I that I went up into this area, and uh, but I've been back several times since then. And you know, after that, it's uh, oh, we know that guy. You know, I ain't going out there. You know, you, well, you kids go out there and mess with him, so that, you <laughs> know, you might get a little bit of juvie activity, and that's right. about it. What was he and, uh, charging you? Uh, the first time I went up there, yeah, I got charged, wow. and I was by myself, and uh, and I I stood my ground until um, uh, they got close enough I could see them. I I clicked on a on a about a three million count of power spotlight and caught three of them. Yeah, actually, I caught five of them. Uh, three in one little three in one place, and two to the left of them, about thirty forty yards. Um, coming at me pretty hard and fast when I put the light on them they slammed on the brakes which gave me enough time to get in the truck and open up a large can of gone right yeah. and my old dog Bo was still alive then and he had already abandoned me <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was in the floorboard of the truck whining already wanting to get the hell out of Dodge and, uh, but um, anyway uh, uh had never gotten any more results anywhere similar to that, and and but when I when I went and I and I you know took the the uh, horn with me, um, uh, and I finally got it to work. Finally, it was like you threw a switch. The woods just erupted. Unbelievable. And I'd been up there screwing around for forty five minutes, 
And uh, it was, and I figured I'd already run in. Anything that was there, I'd already run them off. Mm -hmm. No, uh, uh no, they were still, they were just, they were probably sitting there, you know, that asshole, would he shut up and leave us alone, you know, that <laughs> kind of a deal. And then it, when I hit it, it was instantaneous. And, uh, it, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. And, uh, there was a, uh, a fellow researcher and a researcher from Iowa was with me and he's like, uh, well, he had a pretty, pretty good long line of expletives. <laughs> That I will not repeat here. Right. <laughs> but it must uh, be that, fulfilling all at the same sense. I mean, yeah, terrifying. Yeah. But you know, like you yeah. said, it's just a you know, it's just a, yeah. a great feeling because you're actually you you've succeeded yeah. in bringing them to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a <clears throat> we had a you know, I started up there, I went up there by myself that particular night, and uh, and then I. He had said, he said, hey, you know, and I had talked to him on the phone on the way up, and he was tied up at work. And uh, and so uh, I was up there, and uh, and I was, you know, down in, in this pretty deep uh, uh, creek valley, or, you know, creek bottom. And uh, my cell phone rang a time or two, and I, and I thought it was him trying to call me. And so I got in the truck and drove up, drove up out of there where I could get cell reception talked to him and he said hey you know um he was only about 30 miles away and he said i hadn't had supper but i just got off work and he said where are you and i told him and he said all right meet me such and such a place so i went and i met him and we grabbed some supper and then uh we jumped in my truck and off back down we went where i'd already been and we like i said we I wrestled with that thing for quite a while still couldn't do anything and I don't know, I don't know what happened, but uh, I uh, I'd been putting chapstick on my lips, <laughs> and my lips are getting really parched and dry, and I and I just I said I ain't putting any more chapstick on, and and uh and so I just uh, I cut loose on it again, and man, I hit the right, I just hit the right note for about three or four seconds, and like I said, just like you flipped the switch. And uh, the unbelievable responses from two or three different directions. <clears throat> That's amazing. And and we started he- and we heard- started hearing uh, stuff coming towards us. I mean, fast coming towards us. And he 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 was you know over there and yanked the truck door open and <laughs> one one foot up in the floorboard of the truck ready you know and ready to get the hell out of Dodge. And, he said, hey, "Come on, man, we gotta go." And I said, no, "Hang on, hang on, hang on." And uh, and and another thing too, it doesn't just turn on the boogers when you do it right. They, there were uh, there was a pack of coyotes with Bonzo, hmm. uh, right up the road. They, in fact, when we when we cranked the truck up to get out of there finally, um, and this was. I mean, we didn't we didn't run off. They didn't they didn't scare us off or anything like that. They just came up and just stopped and got quiet, and and we couldn't get them to come any closer. But we we shined around. We were getting little glimpses of eye shine and stuff like that. And so we were able to figure out that you know what was going on, and we uh, we could we were catching them in our thermal and uh, just glimpses of them and stuff, and and we realized that, that they had come to a point and they weren't going to come any closer. Sort of like when you're turkey hunting, you know, and you're and uh, you're calling a big gobbler in, and he, get, he gets to a point, and then he hangs up, and no matter what you do, he's not going to come any any further. So we had this 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 went on for you know thirty minutes or more, and we got ready to leave, and we'd heard all these coyotes up the road west of us that uh that just went ape when I when I when I finally was able to blow it right. When we started to leave, the truck was pointed west, and so I cranked up, and I went up the road, came around a curve, and there was a whole pack of coyotes in the road milling around. Wow. And, yeah, that was sort of weird. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I sort of wondered, we sort of wondered if, if maybe the boogers had been after the coyotes, and they were sort of out in the road, so they'd get a little, this place is real, this place is really thick also. We were sort of wondering if they were 
maybe out in the road so they get a little little bit of a buffer zone, you know, visibility buffer zone between them and the boogers. Right. Uh, the, you know, the boogers at certain times of the year really love to, to kill the coyotes. Right. But, um, kind of give the coyotes an advantage to see them coming at least and get them. Exactly. Coming. Well, it's the same thing as what we do. <clears throat> you know, I do, I do not like to call from a, a place where you were in the, you know, the woods and everything and all the veg, high vegetation is up right up there close to us. I like to have a, a little buffer zone of, of open open ground, you know, even if it's only 30, 40 feet right. uh, where I can where I can see them. You know, have a have a little split second chance of seeing them because hell we've had them we've had them bust out right on top of us before and um yeah that that's not uh, <laughs> that must be absolutely terrible <laughs> sounds good it sounds the story sounds good telling it later on but when it's happening it's not very fun yeah because you don't know what you don't know what you're, they're going to do that must be um, terrifying because you know you don't yeah. have any time like you said you you need that buffer zone to see kind of. Mm-hmm. And even if it's only a split second, at least your mind kind of puts a plan together, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And wow, yeah. that must have been a terrible. Yeah. What what state did that happen in? Uh, this was uh, this was in Iowa, oh, okay. southeastern Iowa, where so, this uh, where this uh, or excuse me, not south. It's, this was in eastern Iowa, where uh, where we finally got it to work the first time. Okay. And then I started trying to trying to practice with it, and um, problem I found was trying to find a place to, that I could practice where I, that I wasn't stirring them up. And um, while I was playing around with the thing, um, just just trying to do do different things with it. You can blow you can blow one of the damn things and make it sound like just like an old bullhorn like we used to use for calling the dogs when we were coon hunting. Okay. And I was playing around. I, I actually used it rather than I've got a bullhorn, but uh, I actually used it rather than than my bullhorn to to call the dogs a few times. And then they they came into it, but then I ended up with a booger in the backyard a couple of nights later, and not only in the backyard came right up on the deck and. Looked in the bedroom door at us. Jeez, I'm crazy. Uh, we had a, a, a we had a deck and we're laying there sound asleep in the bed about one thirty in the morning, and and um, all of a sudden, our female German Shepherd just went ballistic, and she and the other two male shepherds just nearly took the took the south wall of the house out. You know, nearly took the whole door out of the side of the house, and. They were going crazy. I thought, what in the hell? And I, I sat up in bed, and we got motion lights out there. And there was a damn booger standing there on the deck, uh, looking in the door. And once I, when I raised up in the bed, did it, but because there weren't, we didn't have any lights on in the bedroom, somehow it saw me. I don't know if it just saw the extra motion or whatever, but it saw me, and it whirled and went running down the uh, the deck. And I mean, that thing, I don't know what the thing weighed, but it, well, I figured it weighed over 500 pounds anyway, because it shook the house when it went running. And the deck is from the point that it took off to the far end of the deck, where the stairs are that go out into the yard, is 60-something feet, about 63 feet, um, roughly 60, 62 to 65 feet. Wow. And um, it shook the house every time its foot hit the deck. And later on, and, and I mean, it, it, my, you know, my wife heard all this stuff too. And so the next morning, you know, we're, we're talking about everything. And she's mad at me for calling the thing up there, you know, to the house accidentally and scaring her half to death and scaring the dogs and everything. And, uh, the dogs really weren't scared. They, they wanted a piece of it because it was trespassing in their territory. And, um, but, um, I got out there and jumped up and down on the deck as hard as I could, and she said I wasn't even close to the to jarring the house, the place like like that booger wow. did. And I went and I went running down the deck in in big high jumps, and you know hitting as hard as I could, 
and she said that was nothing. She said it was not even remotely similar to the when the booger ran off. So he was huge. And then the next day to add insult to injury, that afternoon uh, we were out working in the yard, and I found a uh, a trackway where it had to come up from the uh, from the creek there on the back of the place, and it had come up in the yard. We'd been having some rain. I found a pretty good little trackway. And one of the tracks, it was a 17-inch track, or 17, 17, and a half inch track, right in the middle of my wife's little miniature hosta bed. She collects miniature hosta plants, okay. and she had this, I built her this nice three-level bed out there in the backyard, and it, it stepped right in the middle of one of those hosta beds and mashed some of her little, you know, pretty rare miniature hostas. And I caught the dickens for that too. And, I, <laughs> and before I could, she got mad enough before I could get the, I was going to try to cast the tracks and she tore the track up. She pissed off at me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, so the agreement was made then that there would be no more blowing the thing around, uh, no more, you know, doing that to call the dogs and no more practicing around the house, no more <laughs> any of that anywhere on our property. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I got I noticed in the comment section, uh, because you know, like I said, I had said I was talking to you, and uh, mm -hmm. a person actually said the same thing I was thinking, and something that made complete sense to me when when you shared it with me was mm -hmm. the fact that there's four varieties of Bigfoot, Dogman being the fourth. And, you know, since that day, I, that's my, my go-to now, you know, um, and a lot of people, like you just said, think these things are Nephilim related. Uh, and I've heard, you know, I've had a couple people talking and, that think like, okay, well, if the Sasquatch is the Nephilim or related to, we'll not say the, but related to, then possibly the dog man and the third variant of this um, would almost be like a chimera. Uh, mm -hmm. Where did you come up with the idea of the four being, you know, related? Where did that come from? Well, well, like I said, I've been I've been studying these things, and I mean, I saw my first one when I was four years old, okay. and right outside my bedroom window. Wow! And I've I've you know heard about them from my from my grandparents. You know, my dad told me a little bit about them. You know, my uh, you know I I had it didn't take me very long to figure out that that there were. Two different kind. The ones that are on our farm are the type ones. They're the big ones, like in the in the in the Patterson Gimlin film, the Patty type we call them. But then in other places, the the, the descriptions of them and and, and and what I eventually later saw for myself, they're they're a little shorter, they're skinnier, and their head is shaped somewhat different, and they seem to be a little bit more belligerent, you know, a little bit uh, more aggressive. And so, and the, they're the ones I call now the Neanderthal type or Neanderthal type, in a, or, or type two. Right. So I, I knew that, and now, I also knew in areas where I had, you know, spent years of my life and been studying these things and, and watching them and calling them and, you know, tried to have, and they knew me, and that I noticed that they didn't really mix, that they remained distinct, distinctly different over decades of time. Okay. And, and even though they lived in amongst each other. Now, down here in the South, the type ones are by far the least common of the two major types, the type one, type, type two. The swamp ape type, Neanderthal type, uh, you know, they are much more prevalent. And, now, you know, how I, you know, how we ended up with the type 
ones on our farm, I don't know. But uh, it's just the way it is. And uh, but uh, but I, I I learned about the two different kinds. But from the time I started seriously studying these things and see and talking to people and taking down signing reports and stuff in the night in the late nineteen seventies. The very first report that I ever took from somebody where I sat down with them and they told me what they'd seen, and I talked to the mother and both of the sons and took their report, it didn't jive with anything I'd seen or heard of. Well, well excuse me, I had heard some stuff, but it didn't jive, jive with anything that I had seen before. And I... But I didn't know what else it could be. And this was in about 1978 that I took this report. And uh, then fast forward to 1984. And I've heard more about these things. And I've heard people talk about this thing that the, the locals, someone would call them the goat man. Okay. Others would call them. Others would call him, um, uh, oh, what was my, our next one, uh, he called him a, a hank dog. I had a, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Morrison on the farm next door to us. He, he was talking about seeing this big, huge dog-like creature, dog-headed creature, and he called it a, a hank dog. Hmm. And, um, and, uh. And, you know, a hank's a country word for ghost or, or demon or something like that. Right. And, you know, I, w I, would, I would hear that stuff. And then I heard that this, I had one guy give me a really good description of this thing he called a goat man. And, uh, and the, how the back legs were made, how it looked like that they bent backwards and a bunch of stuff like that. And, the, and, the, and how the fur laid on the legs and, and he'd seen it run off down the road, and then I talked to, the, to a guy that was a cook at a um, at a at a sportsman's club, at a at a hunting club, and that this thing would come up and raid their their they didn't have dumpsters in, they had big fifty five gallon drums and throw all their garbage in. And how this thing would come up and raid the garbage cans and stuff, and um, uh, and I was hearing these descriptions and and uh. I'm thinking, you know, what the heck is that? And then in 1984, and by this time I was working for NASA, and we had a big project going, and and we were getting ready for the very first Department of Defense, you know, classified mission that the shuttle was going to fly. And we were they were building a huge ground station and a bunch of uh, communication and and data. Uh, storage, recording and storage uh, facility there at Redstone Arsenal or, or Marshall Space Flight Center. Okay. And I was one of the lead engineers on mm -hmm. the thing. And we had a contractor down in South Alabama and was building a lot of that equipment for us. And we were staying in Troy, Alabama and working up in a, towards to the northeast near a little place called Union Springs. and. They, uh, I started hearing a lot of reports of things going on, uh, Bigfoot activity around Troy, Alabama. That's where I first heard about what now people call urban Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot coming into regularly coming into urban areas after hours to raid dumpsters and stuff like that. And I started hearing a lot of reports of that. Well, then I had, I think I've, may have related the story to you before. I know that anybody that's listened to me very much has heard me tell the story. Had a couple of ladies that, that worked for me yep. that came to work, and these were very, very highly educated te electronic technicians. They were building a lot of this equipment for us and putting it together and testing it and such and you know, helping us test it. And very, very intelligent, ed well-educated, highly skilled ladies. They came to work one morning, and it's, we were having our kickoff meeting, you know, which we'd have every morning at 7, uh, 
we talk with the night shift folks and tell her they tell update us of what they got done and problems they found and and then I'd lay out the work and what we were going to get done for that day and and uh, who was going to do what or and, and all and these two ladies were really upset. I mean, really upset. They were totally distracted. Uh, they weren't listening to anything that I was saying. And uh, so after the we got a kickoff meeting, I asked them to you know hang back. So I said, you know, I said, what's the matter, ladies? Well, they were, one of them was in tears. I said, I said, I said, if you had a death in the family, I mean, do you need to take off? I mean, what's, what's going on? I mean, and they didn't want to talk. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I said, were you robbed? Did something happen? And they drove every day. In fact, I, I was staying in a motel in Troy and they lived in Troy. And we were driving every day up to a place out in the country outside of Union Springs. And um, it's pretty pretty long drive on U.S. Highway 29, which winds and twists around through the countryside there. And um, sit, shut the door, sit down. I said, ladies, I said, y'all can't go out there and work on this in this kind of shape. Do you need to have the day off? I mean, do you need to just go home to take a day off? I mean, what's what's? No, I said. Well, tell me what's the matter. Well, you won't believe this. And I said, you'd be surprised what I'll believe. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, because I didn't let nobody know about my interest in Bigfoot at that time. You know, and with with the government you know, where I worked, and and so I said, I said, well, what what happened? And well, we had something bad happen on the way to work. And so I thought maybe they'd been robbed or somebody ran them off the road. You know, I didn't know what. And so I got the question, well, that wasn't it. And one of the ladies, as she kept getting, she started, was crying. She kept getting more and more upset. I said, look, I said, just tell me. I said, I'll keep it secret. Just tell me what you saw. And I, I mean, well, I just tell me what happened. And said, well, we saw a monster on the road or, or no. No, she said, we saw a werewolf on the road. I said, really? And she said, yes. And I don't remember the exact words of the conversation, but they still were reluctant to open up. So I went out to my car and the guy opened the trunk of my car, got out one of my journals, one of my log books, brought it in and let them just open up and look at some of that stuff. I let them read a couple of my Bigfoot reports that I had that I had taken. And some of them, the straw that broke the camel's back for them, or that, that, that led them, where they, they recognized the name of one of the people that I had interviewed there in, that had had, a, had an encounter in a, there outside of Troy. They recognized the name. And when they saw that, that gave them the impetus to, to open up to me. And they were coming to work, and, and they described it perfectly. They came around a curve, and they they saw it coming up out of a creek bed on the on the right hand side of the, the road, and it walked up onto the shoulder of the road right right and stopped right on the shoulder beside a curve sign, and and it stopped and was staring at them. And the lady that was a passenger that was on the passenger side of the front seat, she was the one that was by far the most upset, and she said. That the, they both said the thing was just unbelievably evil, and that it had just just uh, an e an an evil aura about it or persona about it that was just absolutely palpable, you know. That and the lady that was in the passenger seat that was crying so badly, she said the thing looked her right in the eyes and was trying to suck her soul out of her body, is what she said. And the lady that was driving, it scared her, and she slammed on the brakes and came almost to a complete stop. And the things, she said it sort of leaned forward a little bit and was looking down, looking right in the car at them through the, through the windshield, and the lady in the passenger seat started screaming at her to go, 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 you know, uh, you know don't stop. And, and so she floorboarded it, 
And she said, as the thing went by, it was still looking in right at her. And she said she felt it trying to pull her soul out of her body. And, um, and then the lady who was driving, she said she glanced up in the rearview mirror and it crossed the road behind them, at, you know, as they went by. And I said, uh, I said, can you find the place? Can you, could you show me this place? Uh, and they said, yes, they could. So that evening, uh, when we got off, uh, I mean, we didn't get off till 7 p.m., but it was summertime. And so it was still daylight till, you know, nearly 9 o'clock. So we took off down there, and she showed me. They stopped, and they showed me where where this all happened. And I found, you know, I could tell that something large had come up out of that out of that uh, creek bed right there and, and did come up right up on the shoulder right there by the sign. And I asked them how high up the, the thing was and, you know, how high its head was. And I had to, uh, I ended up getting a, um, a stick or something like that that, uh, uh, and held up there. Normally in my personal vehicle, I keep a, um, I'll keep a, keep something in there like a stick of bamboo or something like that or, 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 um, a hoe handle or something. And, paper plate and some some duct tape or you know electric tape or a staple gun and I'll attach that to, to that sticker stick or whatever and I'll hold it up high and I'll tell them to you know stop me when when uh you know it's it's where the thing's head was and uh, that's why I uh, help, you know sort of figure out how tall the things were but anyway they had it marked pretty good both of them did and um and it was about nine feet tall and they described the legs of it and everything and you know that it was they said it looked just like a big humongous dog that you stood it up and um and they uh and they described the legs they they uh it had they described it had it had very prominent canine teeth that they could clearly see um you know fangs they called it and um but they said that it, um, I've had some people telling me that, you know, when they're describing a thing that they saw horns, but I, I think that may be when they, when the thing's got his ears laid back. Right. And, uh, they said that, uh, they said the thing definitely had ears, but they said they were, they were, you know, they were, the ears were laid down sometimes, sometimes the ears stood up and, um, but they were, they looked like deer ears, you know, like a German shepherd or a wolf or a Dublin pincher or something would have. And, um, but once they, they gave me such an excellent description, you know, firsthand, very recent description. Oh, they wouldn't hang around there with me for very long. They left. Yep. So I went across the road and I found the thing's tracks going up the side of the, the pretty high bank or the bank about, about 13, 14 feet tall, um, on the other side of the road, I found one track from, if I remember correctly, its left foot, and another track about six feet, a little bit over my head, uh, about a halfway up the bank, and then another track about a foot short of the top of the bank. That thing scaled that, that, um, that bank in one complete stride. When I say a stride, I mean, this is when you take off with your right foot and um, say a stride is when you take off with your right foot and then your left foot hits the ground. Your right foot hits ground, your left foot hits ground, and when your right foot hits ground the next time, that's a stride. Did I say that right? Uh, anyway, it's a stride is from the heel of the track from the right foot to the heel of the of the track, the next right foot track. Okay, that is a stride. Um, now that track that you that, saw that, was it that was clear? Because a couple of people said, asked questions, you know, like um, mm -hmm. the <clears throat> type four, as we know, dog, what yeah. we call dog man. Um, yeah, is there any resemblance to? Let's say our track, like the Sasquatch, has a very no, 
just it's no, more this, like this thing, That's why I say that, that. That's why I'm sure that this is a a completely different different creature. Okay. Totally, totally unrelated to Bigfoot because Bigfoot have plantigrade feet. In other words, every step they take, take their heel hits the ground. When they're standing still, their heel is on the ground. This is when they're upright now, not when they're down quadrupedal, but when they're standing upright, their heel is on the ground just like us. Every step they take, their heel hits the ground just like us. The, the, um, uh, these dog men have digitigrade feet. In other words, they walk on the ball of their feet, the ball of their foot, and their toes. Their heel is actually like the hock on a dog or a horse. You know, it's, it never touches the ground. Uh, that's why people say that they, they, the people describe dog legs, or, you know, dog men, they say that their leg it bends backwards. Yeah. Well, it really doesn't. It's, it's just that their heel is off the ground. They have a knee just like we do, but the knee is up higher next to their, you know, right about even with their, their belly, you know. But their their hock or what is on a human or a, or a great ape or a Bigfoot is their heel is up higher. It never, it doesn't touch the ground. Unless, like, you know, some dogs, when they bow up to take a poop, they'll, they'll rock back on their, on their heel or their hock, you know, and they're, when they're pooping. But uh, but um, I have one of my German shepherds does that. The other two don't. But um, but when they're walking, their their heels don't touch the ground. Uh, like I said, they have digitigrade feet, and their tracks you see you see just you see just the ball of the foot and the toes. Now these toes did have claws. I mean the the tracks did show claw marks. Uh, on them, so they have they do have canine type claws. Sometimes you'll see a toenail drag on a Bigfoot track if the ground is soft enough, but they don't. But Bigfoot don't have claws like a dog. Um, don't have claws. Right. Okay. Um, so now what about the now, the third the third variety that you. The, the third variety is something that I don't know. The jury's still out on what that is, okay. you know, but, but it is related to a Bigfoot. It is a primate. Okay. Because it, it has plantigrade feet. It, I think there is a chance that it could be some kind of genetic defect or genetic throwback. Um, because, a fair amount of the of the what I call type three tracks, which they have, or where they have, you can see the heel, the heel mark. You know, they have plantar great feet, but a fair amount of the tracks have only show three toes. Hmm. And so, even humans at times, you know, there are humans that are born with some of their toes webbed together, and even some of their fingers webbed together. Right. So if they walked like that, you know, they would show a three-toed track yeah. or four to or only four toes, you know, however they happen to be webbed together. But, but, um, also I have seen, I have seen their tracks that have claws or there's definite, there are definite claw marks at the end of the toes. And that's another one I can't figure, but. I also do know this that when those when when those type threes oh but the type threes also have a some people call them baboon looking heads some people call them you know dog looking heads right but they're, they're the heads are different than the type fours the canid types you know the, the, I call the type fours what I call the canid type but uh, and it may be the source of the old Egyptian god Anubis and you know, some of these other things. Or maybe the Luke Gurus or the werewolves and stuff like that of, you know, of infamy. But the type three is something, is something different. It's, it's not, I think it's probably close enough to, to a type one or type two that they could interbreed. And like I said, it may be some kind of physical defect, but. Again, I know this, they keep to themselves. 
they don't get along with the others, with the type 1s or type 2s. And the reports that I've heard from some reliable sources in different places around the country are that when these type 3s show up, the other Bigfoot leave. They they let them ha- they 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 let them have the let them have their territory. Okay. They don't. They don't. At least that's the that's some of the reports that I've been told. You know that I've heard I've heard that several times in several in several parts of the country. I mean, places as 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 diverse as uh, as Texas and and you know, Oklahoma, um, uh, Iowa, um, uh, North Carolina. Um, and I think these type threes of, of the four types, these type threes are the most rare. Okay. I get less reports of those than, than any of the other, than any of the other three. Have you actually had an, like a a interaction or or spotted one or? No, 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 I have, I have never seen, I have never seen one. Okay. And I've only ever myself seen the tracks two times. Hmm. Once in Mississippi and once in Louisiana. Wow. Now, I've seen some really good photographs of them, but as far as putting my eyes on them, I've only ever seen them two times, okay. the tracks. And uh, and another thing that I've heard, and I first heard this in Texas and didn't think much of it. The second time I heard it was in Oklahoma, and then I've uh, heard it several times up in an area of Iowa. And and I've heard it, and um, in fact, uh, you know, I've had a, uh, I've heard it in the, in North Carolina, <laughs> and my great grandmother had talked about sort of she, in a cryptic way, but uh, that these things, uh, these type threes, that they really stick close together, and that if if you find one, you're there, there's absolutely going to be more of them there and there's an area that there's a couple of different places i know where uh those are about all you're going to find in certain areas but they don't they don't live in amongst the other ones you know, when these guys show up the rest of them get out of there okay uh, but um and then they can be in fairly large groups you know like up in the you know 20 to 30 of them wow, wow. um but you know, I've 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 investigated that you know that kind of reports two or three times you know where where there were large groups of them. Right. That that's but interesting. Again, though, I've never I've never laid eyes on one. Right. Now, if you want to see what one looks like, though, look at the do a search for the Beast of Seven Shoots. Right. It's at uh, Seven Shoots is a park park up in Quebec. Or Quebec, I think that's correctly pronouncing it. Or <laughs> Quebec, I'm not sure. Whatever. Um, anyway, and uh, and this guy got a good picture of one, and it is it is exactly what I've heard descriptions of. You know, going back into the '90s. Right. Uh, you look at it, and it, and it does look more, much more baboon faced. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard. And I've I've heard quite a few people just refer to them as the snouted ones, okay. You know, yeah. which they've got like a a baboon type snout on them. Right now, um, um, you're I love the way that you know cause it just made me remember. I think it was the first time you and I talked, um, when we were talking about one and two, and you said, "Uh huh." Look at the picture of the Neanderthal. My, right. and, and take away, take away the stick, and that, and that's what you've got. And yeah, take away the stick and get rid of the the vertical slit pupils. Yep. And and put a more more human, a little bit more human type nose on it. Uh, that is, you know, maybe more Aboriginal or or you know a little bit more African looking nose or Aboriginal looking nose and. And then you've got a, you know, you've got a type two. And, you know, they're, uh, 
the the type the type threes their body form is like a type two. Okay. But they've got but they've got a different head, and um, and like I said, uh, it's pretty common when you you know when I've heard type three report or reports that I I classified as a type three that the that they would have um um three toed tracks. Okay. Now. You don't hear, there's very few people talk about this, but there have been uh, a number of tracks found, supposedly. I've not seen, I've seen a couple of photographs of them, but I've never seen one myself. But out in the Pacific Northwest area, starting in Northern California, going all the way up into into the uh Coast, western coast of Canada, that there is a like a sub variety of type ones that have a weirdly splayed uh, toes. That their toes are are spaced differently. Or it's been so long since I've seen one of these these photographs that I can't remember exactly what it was. But I've heard reports of that multiple times from people that have seen them out along in the Pacific Northwest that they found these tracks that the toes were really odd. Now, I don't know if that could have been from some that had broken their toes at some point in their life and they just healed back crazy. Mm -hmm. But then there was a, um, and I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, there was a researcher I talked to, and he firmly believed that that was a subset of the type ones, or what I call the type ones, or the the petty type, and um, that that their that their toes were made different, some because of the terrain or something like that, or because of them climbing trees more or something. I don't remember the all the details of it, but that was an interesting little thing because uh, you know there are. There are some, there are people out there that say that there's a whole lot more than just four types. Right. Yeah. And I didn't include, I I actually include in my list five types, number five being the little people. And I've never seen a little, uh, anything to, that would fit the description of little people. Uh, but I know a few very reputable researchers that, that swear that they've had encounters with them. Would that be like? Well, I'm not discounting. Would that be classified as like elf kind of, or because I've done a couple of, uh, I had a couple of encounters sent to me with people talking about like a five to four foot sized Sasquatch looking, um, you know, creature. Mm -hmm. Would that be a little person, or would you consider that an adolescent or juvenile? Squatch? Well, you know. <clears throat> It's hard to say. You know, they, they found what it in Sumatra. They've pretty much proven the the uh, orang pendak. Yeah. They've actually found skeletal remains and such as that. I wonder if it could just be an orang pendak. But they seem to ha be, one thing about them is they seem to be, you know, quite pugnacious. And they, and it's pretty common to, uh, hear reports about them using vegetation, you know, to, to camouflage themselves with, you know, putting stuff on their heads and, and, uh, stuff like that. And that they supposedly are extremely strong for their size. Okay. And then there, then there are people that tell you it doesn't take but a couple of them to drag a, drag a grown human off and, and eat him. They're supposed to be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bad predators that, and that they are not beyond grabbing and eating a human supposedly. Wow. But that's just some stuff I've heard. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. In fact, that's just, you know, right. campfire stories I've heard about them. And, um, but like I said, I don't, uh, anything like that. I've just heard people talk about them. So, so don't throw any, so any people listening to this, don't throw rocks at me because I, I don't embrace them and don't throw rocks at me because 
I sort of blow them off or, or, or because of me repeating some things that I've heard from other folks. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know anything about them. I've never, I've never spent any time researching them. I just know uh, uh, a few reputable researchers that are, that are pretty well known that, uh, that, that strongly believe in them and that have actually had encounters with them. Yeah. Um, what was the, if you don't mind sharing and if you can share, mm-hmm. what would be your, your most, well out in the field, your most terrifying event that you've had? Hmm. Uh, one of the most, one of the scariest things that ever happened to me was when I was a kid, uh, my dad and I were fishing down um, on the Tennessee River in a backwater called in a in a big uh, impoundment or uh, not really impoundment. And we're on Pickwick Lake uh, of the Tennessee River up in an area that's called Bear Creek. Okay. And and this is where Bear Creek uh, empties into the uh, Tennessee River. It's pretty wide there, and it was early. It was early, it was spring fairly early spring when the largemouth bass are spawning. And one of the places they like to spawn is along what we call red banks. And they're these high red clay and chert banks that are along the river. And the wave action sort of erodes them, and it washes uh, this fine gravel down along the base of it. And the bass like to get in there and and fan out beds, and they lay their eggs and stuff in there, and it's a terrifically good place to fish. And one of the best methods for that is you use a jig, a rig called a jig and pig, and you, and you pick a color and everything to make it look like a crawdad or crawfish. And uh, you cast in towards the shore, and you have to start cranking pretty quickly and working it, or it'll sink down and get hung up in the rocks, because those rocks are really irregular shaped and a lot of holes in them and stuff. So we were fishing along this red bank, and I, um, it was sort of windy that morning, so I was using a, uh, uh, I think I was using a 3 8 ounce jig with a, with a uh, pork rind, uh, you know, uh, deal on the, on the back of it, and um cast in I didn't didn't reel fast enough and it got hung up and so my dad uh, starts uh, he turns the boat around he starts backing the with the with the trolling motor starts backing the boat in towards the bank so I can get my uh, my, my lure un, unhung so I'm up on the back of the boat and I'm and I'm you know jiggling my line and everything and trying to get the the, the lure loose and I'm right, we're right up under this bank that's about 20 feet tall and 15 to 20 feet tall. And I, I'm straight down underneath it and I'm sitting there j- jerking my lure up. And about the time I get my lure loose from right up straight above me, this damn booger lets out an ungodly scream, screamed right down on us. And I mean, it's just, it's so loud. I mean, it literally would have almost blown your head off, <laughs> your head. I mean, wow. I mean, it actually shook, shook both my dad and I to the core. I mean, it, it, it shakes your whole body. I mean, it's unbelievably loud. I mean, ear splitting loud. The most ungodly loud scream. And I, as the first time I was ever screamed at at that close range, and I literally like to lost everything. And I came flying. I was up on the rear casting deck. I came flying off the, the casting deck, running up towards the front of the boat. And my dad stomps on the, uh, spins the trolling motor around and stomps down on the button, you know, and turns it wide open. And, uh, and getting us, trying to get us out of there. We're, we're too close in to crank up the big motor. And, uh, and we're trying to pull out, and the thing screams at us uh, like one or two more times. I mean, unbelievably loud. And that absolutely terrified me. I mean, shook me to my core. Yeah, I can imagine. And, 
<laughs> it scared us so bad that when we came home, I mean, we fished for another hour probably after that. When we came home, my mom knew something had happened. She said we were both wild-eyed, you know. <laughs> it, scared, it scared both of us so bad. But one of the, as far as being out on a research trip, I guess one of the scariest things that ever happened to us is we were down in, uh, in East Texas in the Big Thicket area. And um, this area is totally ruined now for research, and uh, they've come in and clear cut it all, and uh, and pretty much ruined it as a research area because we ran our mouths about it too much, and, and too many people got going got to going down there, and there was too much very easily visible sign, and it, it became just about a circus back in the early two thousands, but. Uh, Anyway, we were down in this area of East Texas in the Big Thicket, and um, we'd heard a lot of sighting reports from this area. And so there was a group of about, and we'd taken a fairly large group in there. We were camping down there. We took, I think there were 19 of us. And we'd gone back into an area where we, there, were, there was lots and lots of sign. We'd scoped it out. Um, that day, I mean, the, the day before, or, or, or that day, and we went back into this area that night. And um, on the way in, we passed a, this is in a, uh, a Texas State Park, and, uh, or a recreation area. We topped the, we passed a horse camp where, uh, and around these horse camps, seems to be a pretty good place uh, often, and I don't know what the attraction is, but the boogers seem to hang around them. I don't know if they if there's extra good stuff for them to, to steal or, or they got better dumpsters there or what, I don't know. But we just passed this horse camp, and we topped the hill, and as I came over the hill, right in my high beams, there was an absolutely enormous light, very, very light beige colored Bigfoot crossing the road. And this dude was like 11 and a half, 12 feet tall. It was freaking enormous. I've never seen another one that size before. Now, since then, and I, I have found several people down there that are living in that area that they've they've known about this particular one for ages and knew how big it was. And uh, so this has been corroborated by quite a few different people and uh, the size of this thing. But with it was a normal uh, another one that was normal sized. And these were these were the type one type. This was a type one. And um Anyway, so we catch the thing in our in our spotlight in, in my in my high beams. Instantly, the guy that was on the in the front seat, you know, passenger side, and the guy was on the on the passenger side in the uh, you know the right hand side of the back seat of my truck. Where I was in a Ford F two fifty crew cab, I was driving. They went. They grabbed. They each had spotlights, and they went out the windows with the spotlights. And started trying to get them and light them up with spotlights. Well, the big one got across the road. He disappeared in the woods across the road. Well, I had a hand, just a, a like a six D cell mag light with a xenon bulb in it. I went out the window on the uh, on the driver's side and was shining in the woods trying to see where that big one went. And in the meantime, the other two guys are hollering at me to uh, the one that was the side of the road. And uh, and they had him sort of pinned down with the spotlights, and he was behind a big bush. Well, I looked around, and about that time, it came running out from behind the bush, and it and it was going to try to run ahead of us and cross the road. Well, I I floorboarded the truck and cut him off, and the guys were just they were just about sunburning him with those spotlights, <laughs> and uh, he uh. 
and he ran and he stopped and he started screaming at us again. And, uh, and then he whirled and tried to run across again. Now, mind you, he couldn't go behind us because, because behind me were two other vehicles, two vans that were with us. And like I said, there was 19 people in this caravan. And so, and they were all trying to get up there to see what was going on because they, you know, they were seeing, you know, seeing the lights and everything and getting glimpses of it. And so this thing took off, like I said, for the second time and tried to run in front of us and I cut him off and slammed on the, you know, it ran back off the road. We slammed on the brakes. We're shining the spotlight on him. He screamed at us. It took off a third time and we cut him off again. And then it took off a fourth time and we cut him off and it, and it just, and it stopped and it screamed at us two or three times and it turned around and went running back through the woods away from the road, uh, you know, back to the right from the direction it had originally come, I assume. And so everybody was all excited about that. So we get down to the place where we decided we were going to do our calling. And we got out and we did our normal thing. Everybody got their vehicles turned around, pointed them in the safe way out of there. We got out and we tried to keep people as quiet as we could. And we had some people there with cameras and, and, a, and a person with a, at that time, it was a, about the best low light video camera that you could get. It was one that Sony made. And now this is in the very early 2000s. And we, uh, we got kept as quiet as we could for about 20, 30 minutes. And then I made one call and got a lot of response. I mean, a lot of response from several, from multiple directions. Hmm. And it sort of calmed down a little bit. And I made one more call. And when I made the second call, the other one, we got all these responses from different directions and they just kept going. And we could tell they were working their way towards us. They, when I did the second call, they, they got homed in on where we were. And so they're coming in to us. We had some very early thermal devices with us. And as they got close, myself and two other guys were concentrating on keeping track of where they were. At one point, we had 16 individual thermal targets coming in on us. 16 now. There were 19 of us. As they were getting closer, we saw a couple of those ones we thought were single targets start splitting. And we started being able to take out, well, then, oh, there's really two there? Uh Oh, no, 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 there's three. And we just kept turning around and around trying to keep count of how many they were, and they were coming closer. And as they got close, it was like they were trying to, they were like trying to, they were doing so many calls back and forth amongst themselves, doing all these owl calls and, and crow calls and, and roosters, and, and some of them were braying like donkeys. And I mean, just this crazy crap that they were doing. And, and it, was, it was comical <laughs> to, it, to me at first. And then I realized as they were getting closer and it was getting louder and louder, several of the people in the group were becoming disoriented from from the just the unbelievably loud cacophony of of noise. And um, they got kept getting closer and closer, and we realized that we were surrounded on three sides of the of these all these boogers or you know Bigfoot making unbelievable amounts of noise but there was no noise whatsoever coming from one direction but we were still picking up a lot of thermal uh, signal out there a lot of a lot of uh, thermal traces and so we knew and this is pretty typical of how they'll 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 make racket and do things to distract you while some other ones are in stealth mode sneaking up right up on you. Right. And so we were training the 
the thermal on them, the ones coming up behind us. And it was, it was almost like that they figured out that we had them figured out and it pissed them off because all of a sudden, all this racket that they were, uh, noise, all these vocals that they were doing went from being this hilarious collection of just all kind of different noises to, it was like somebody flipped a switch. It, in a, a split second instant, changed from being funny to some of us, or, or, or just you know, really entertaining, really interesting, just really amazing, right. to all of a sudden being dead damn serious threatening. Yeah. I mean, very serious threatening. And we realized they, were, they weren't charging us full-blown, but they were coming right in on us. And one side of this area where we were parked had a thick belt of privet hedge around it. And all of a sudden, they started coming through that privet hedge right out into the parking area where we were. We started trying to get the people get people in the in the vehicles to get the hell out of there. They didn't want to go. The boogers were going crazy. All of a sudden we realized that there were probably there were two dozen at least or more of them right there on top of us. And and they were just coming they were just coming out right out of the bu- right out of the bushes. And then they started coming out around you know, a, a part of the more of the perimeter of the parking area, and there was all of a sudden I looked around and coming out through those hedges was that damn big ass alpha male that just towered above all the rest of them, the big beige colored one, and we were shoving at this point we were grabbing physically grabbing people and shoving them into vehicles, and we got the. We got the first van loaded up, the rear one loaded up, and slammed the doors on it. We were, and there were two or three that were just right there, almost within touching distance of these things. And oh, you know, this is a wonderful. Oh, this is, you know, they were wanting to hug them and kiss them and all this kind of crap. And and these things were screaming and baring their teeth and and, and all this. And yeah, you know, this was this was going downhill quick. We nearly broke a person's leg shoved them into the van and, and actually and slammed the van door on there, oh. one of the back doors of the van on their leg. And I thought I'd broken somebody's leg. Anyway, when we finally got everybody into the into the vans, we start running, myself and the, and the, and the last guy that was out there, we're running to my truck. And the, that big alpha stepped at the other guy and sort of whiffed, whiffed him along the, like the back of his head and, and maybe across the shoulder blade or something. But I thought he had hit him. I thought he had hit him, and, and the way he swung, if he had a, if he had a hit him, it would have nearly taken his head off. I think all he was doing was just trying to scare him. Right. But uh, but he felt the the, the, the wind whiff by, <laughs> by his back of his head and his neck and everything. And he did a full-on dive into the truck, into the passenger side <laughs> front seat of the truck. And in fact, he nearly went and landed all the way over on the driver's side of the truck. And and I, I piled in, and, I just, and the, the truck was already running, thank God. And um, and I don't, I think it was running. I, I don't even really remember starting. I just remember jumping in it, yanking it in gear, and floorboarding it. And, uh, and I think that's when the door shut on the passenger side front, and we went tearing out of there. And uh, and these they were they were at this time they were all out there and they were screaming at us and all this mess. And we went to a place. <laughs> we went to a place two or three miles away, and stopped. And we. First got out just checking to see if everybody, everybody's okay, if we had everybody, Make, making double dog sure we had everybody, that we hadn't left somebody behind. That's my biggest fear, you know, taking people out is fear of somebody being left behind. Well, I, everybody was accounted for. Everybody was okay. The person we'd slammed the van door on, uh, they weren't pissed off. They 
<clears throat> they were laughing about it, and, <clears throat> and so we started. Uh, what'd you get? What'd you get on camera? What'd you? Everybody's camera batteries were screwed. Huh. We got on that on that fancy Sony, which we made sure that everything was fully charged, fresh batteries and everything were, were in everything that weren't wasn't rechargeable. We had a bunch of the vocals that survived on that fancy Sony video camera, but there were no, there was no video at all that was that was visible, you know, that, that you could tell what it was. Nobody else had gotten any, nobody got any pictures. There was only one other recorder that had gotten a, a little bit of the vocals. Out of nineteen people, and probably, probably. Eight to ten of them had had some type of device on them recording. You know that was capable of either taking pictures or video or audio or whatever. We got all we got was a little bit of audio, hmm. and, 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 and they and they had died. Everything had just died. And uh, uh, I had a camera then. It was it was a it was back when Toshiba was was making. Uh, digital cameras, and it was a. At that time, it was a it was a hot rod camera. That thing, and I had just put brand spanking new batteries in it, and that thing was dead as a fritter. I mean, it was totally dead. And uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, I had given it to somebody else to, to use, and uh, and, and it was somebody that knew what they were doing, and uh, and it had just died. I, I, I was so disappointed, but that right there was was probably. I mean, I've had, we've had some really hairy stuff. That's the one that has scared me the most, and has changed the way that we did things because we came very, very, very close to getting somebody killed. Yeah, that's that is terrifying. I mean, just the yeah. way, just the way I'm, you know, I'm mapping it out in my head as you were talking yeah. about it, and. Mm-hmm. To have them three sides verbal, yeah, and, and and thinking, okay, I got a way out of here, but then thermal, yeah. oh God, there's, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it's they a, they were, yeah, and I really don't know how many were there. Uh, we have we have talked amongst ourselves about this. The, the ones about the serious researchers that were in the group, there were there were. Let me think. If I go back, let me see. Mm, four, five. There were about six of us, six or seven of us in the group that were that were serious researchers, and the rest were people that 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 uh, you know that that acquaintances that that we'd gotten to know over social media that that we had invited along that you know if they wanted to come with us they, they that they could, and so. The, the serious research in the group, we have discussed this thing over and over and over and over again over the years, and we all agree that that the good Lord took care of us. I mean, that it is an absolute wonder we didn't, we didn't lose somebody and somebody didn't get hurt or killed. Um, but that, and that's the one that that uh, that, that I've lost the most sleep sleep over, and 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 thought about the most over the years, you know, that what we could have done different or I'm just wondering what it would have been like if it had only been like three or four of us out there. And, you know, and we were serious researchers, right? If we'd have made it out of there alive, uh, because I've been in, uh, myself and a guy named Michael Stuckey, who's a, a good researcher. And, uh, I think he lives in Tennessee now, but Michael and I, the two of us used to go out, quite a bit, and we were down in a place in a conservation area along the Tennessee Tom Beebe Waterway down in Mississippi one time, and we got into a, a deal where, a very similar deal where there was a, uh, we'd made a call, and up a creek up a creek bottom, all these, we got this unbelievable vocalization started up, and they uh, they started in on us, <laughs> coming towards us. And we, Mike had a, had a bionic ear going <laughs> and he had it, and he had it, uh, up and pointed. We were in my truck and, uh, we, 
we'd been out on the road and we decided, uh, uh-uh, no, we got in the truck, we figured we'd get ready to go. So we were in the truck with the windows down and ready to roll, but we had, we had our recorders and everything going and he was recording all this and they were coming in on us and he heard something through the bionic ear. It sounded like crashing through the brush coming towards us and poor old Mike was about to have a fit. And all of a sudden, it burst out of the bush, the brush. I mean, I could hear something coming because it was on my side of the truck. Mike had the bionic ear uh, antenna in his hand up, you know, look, pointed out, out the passenger side front seat, you know, the passenger side window of the front seat, pointed back over the truck, you know, back to the, to the left. But all the racket and the boogers were coming from, from my side. And I could hear something coming, but to Mike with the bionic ear, it sounded like, you know, somebody was crashing, the one they were crashing through the brush right on top of. Well, what came out was a damn armadillo. <laughs> <laughs> and that armadillo had the afterburner zone. He, the boogers were scaring him. He wanted out of there. And I mean, he came flying out. He ran under our truck, under, under the, the driver's side and out front of the, but it it wasn't just a, a few seconds later, and here here came the boogers, wow. and uh, and they were they were quite pissed off at us, and and so we didn't we didn't hang around. They started. Uh, uh, I thought I heard some stuff flying through the through the air, you know, throwing rock, rocks or sticks or whatever. I didn't actually see any of them, but I didn't want to uh, get hit. And, uh, at that time, I wasn't 100% sure, like I am now, that, that they that they don't, you know, I, th- I think if a person gets hit by something thrown by a Bigfoot, it's, it's accidental. Right. That they throw stuff close to you, but not to hit you. Yeah, uh, almost like a, kind of like a warning. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen two people get hit, but it was by ricochets. Okay. And when the person got hit, the throwing stopped after that. Uh, we had a, when my research buddy got, got hit in the shin by a ricocheted, uh, rock about the size of a softball that was thrown at us in, in a, up in a canyon in, in New Mexico. And, um, and they were just, they were bombarding all around us from two different directions. And, uh, <laughs> this rock came from behind us and, and over us and hit a boulder out in front of us and bounced back and hit my buddy in the, in the shin and he hollered and everything. And I mean, instantaneously all the bombardment stopped. And then we were down at a, a place in, in a campground in, in Alabama and, uh, and we were getting pelted by rocks from several different directions. And, uh, one of them hit the roof of a, of a shelter. We were in a, under a pavilion uh, in this park that was, you know, back off in the woods. And, <laughs> rock came in and hit a uh, hit a tree bounced off the roof of the pavilion and hit hit one of the ladies in the group oh. <laughs> and uh <clears throat> she you know you know made a you know ow or something like that right. and i mean the, the bombardment stopped instantly that's amazing um yeah really quick we're coming up on about two and a half hours i don't have much recording time wow. left um i I've got a couple of interesting things that I've been writing down. Uh, I'm going to save for mm-hmm. a next, maybe an, another conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you a, a little hint on one is what you were just talking about with the incident with the vans in the multi people. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to talk about next time we get together is the fact that cameras batteries and things don't seem to Mm -hmm. to stay charged or work um right so i think that'll be you know hopefully we can get some time together again and if you're willing to come back um that'd be great oh yeah but absolutely um like i said we're almost on time and i don't want to run out of time so we're we don't say goodbye but please don't hang up uh when we end the interview um but is there anything that you'd like to say to everybody before we end the interview? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to make a shout out to uh, 
a friend of mine that we had a uh, we had an expedition back in October. Uh, six of us or five or six of us went down to uh, 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 to an area in Oklahoma that we've been wanting to research and had some excellent results and uh, got to got to spend time one of the one of the few times that I've I've parked my booger mobile and and <laughs> and spent the whole time riding with somebody else and I was with uh, my buddy Wade Parker and uh, and we had a great time we we got into the boogers big time down there and in one area and um, we uh, we explored some new territory we uh, we also did something that you've heard of the infamous Brown Springs down there yeah we spent a we spent a whole night down there at a uh, afternoon and and, a, and you know well into the night in the Brown Springs area and we didn't just stay right there at the springs we hit uh, uh, areas up, up and down, uh, 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 the, uh, the Red River Valley there, um, from the, uh, I mean, when I say up and down, I mean, we didn't go all that far, but, but, you know, we, we spread out, we covered an area up and down the river, you know, probably four, four or five miles. And, uh, uh, amazingly, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't find a thing there. In that area, and I think I think those boogers have been messed with too much. And mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but Wade was it was really fun getting to uh, to uh, being in that small group like that. That's the first time we've spent that much time with that small of a group out in a in a while, and um, we had great results. And and uh, it was it was really fun getting to. Uh, uh, to be in the field with Wade. In fact, we uh, he's got he's got one of the best research vehicles I've ever I've ever been in, and it was a uh, he's got a, a Hummer and uh, <laughs> an H three Hummer, and I mean it's 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 ready. He did it right, and uh, I thought though we were going to get a get some windows busted out of it. We got we got uh got into one place and they were throwing everything from bath from a softball to basketball sized rocks in our direction <laughs> and uh had one as we were making our exit out of that place we had one sail uh, probably cantaloupe size sail right over the top of the, the roof of the car <laughs> i wow. heard it coming and heard, and heard it leaving it was clipping limbs as it went wow. <laughs> and it and it hit a it hit a uh, hit a tree trunk all about 10 foot beyond me and uh and ricocheted off i was afraid it's going to hit his car but uh didn't but we had a we had a good time but anyway um i'm hoping to get on and on on uh, future shows to be able to talk about some things that i haven't really shared much uh before a lot of a lot of stuff that we talked about tonight are things that if you've listened to me very much you've you've heard all this stuff yeah most, most of it before yeah yeah well, you know, I'm always open. And I love talking to you. I mean, even when we don't record and we just had these conversations yeah. just recently, I, I, just, yeah. I, I, you're a very interesting guy. I like talking to you a lot. And, um, you know, maybe next time when we get together, we can talk about some things that you haven't shared. Um, what, yeah. I, what I just well, discussed. What? And then I just came up with an idea is how to set up a booger mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm telling you what, I had some ideas, and and uh, Wade took those ideas and built on them tremendously. And man, that thing, that thing is something else. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I had a, it was, it was really a great trip. But uh, yeah, another thing I'd I'd like to do is, you know, if if we can get together, you know, you get together some questions and stuff that you know from listeners or whatever. Yeah, and. Uh, I'd I'd be glad to you know answer questions. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. And what well, things is I'll make a what? I'll make a community post. Um, mm-hmm. tonight I'll I'll think of you know I'll word it really good and then um I'll put it up in the community post, and then subscribers mm-hmm. can ask the questions. Mm-hmm. I'll jot them all yeah. down or print the print it out, and then we can go mm-hmm. from there. Yeah, and uh, you know we. And uh, I'll tell you up front that uh, I'm not scared to say I don't know. 
Right. And if if I if I don't know, I'll I'll tell you I don't know, or and and I'll tell you if it's pure speculation, you know, if, you know what some things are, but a lot a lot of things, you know, um, uh, you know, people have asked me things in the past that uh that I've been able to, you know, they've been told one thing, and I was able to, you know, work through it, and we were able to figure out what was really going on. Right. Um, yeah, and that, that's an honest, right there is honesty, you know, I, it's, mm-hmm. you've been doing this for a very long time, and a lot of people mm-hmm. would consider you an expert, and for you to say, yeah. for you to say, I don't know, is, that's very humbling, you know, and that just shows yeah. what kind of researcher you are, is, mm-hmm. is that, well, so. Uh, another thing is I've said, anybody that's listened to me very much has heard me say that if, if, if you're not, if you're not able to, to, to change your mind about something, to relook at the data and, and, and admit when you're wrong or, or, uh, or realize when you, when you have, uh, have misread something, mm-hmm. then, uh, you know, you're not much of a researcher. That's I've I've had to change my ideas and theories on on a number of things several times. <laughs> right. So, uh, um, you know, we're learning all the time. You know, you if if you're not learning all the time, I mean, none of this stuff is set in stone. Yeah. You know, there's not a Sasquatch uh, four four hundred one. <laughs> you know, or, or graduate level. You know, Sasquatch, re- Sasquatch research manual or something. Right. Uh, all of us that are that are any good are are constantly learning. Yeah. And there's and you know there are people out there that are that do absolutely astoundingly good research and, and work and are coming up with with terrific things that the public never hears about. And, uh, uh, it's, you know, there, there, there are guys out there that know way more than me about, you know, uh, about, you know, certain aspects of, of Bigfoot. And, and I'm, I feel honored when I get to spend time with them. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I just, I guess I just got a big mouth and <laughs> I could talk about it. <laughs> Well, I mean, everybody likes listening to you. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's you know, and it's, it, like you said, I, you like to, you know, you feel honored spending time with certain mm-hmm. people. It's an honor when I get yeah. to speak to you. So, I, yeah. I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me, you know. So, it yeah. means a lot. So, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I appreciate the opportunity and the, uh, and um, you know, and that's one thing I'm about now. I'm, I'm, I like, I like to teach people. Um, uh, I've done that most of my career. they <laughs> teaching people about different things. Right. All righty. All right. Well, I appreciate it. And, um, I look forward to having yeah. you come on again. Why don't you say goodbye to everybody yeah. and we'll, uh, move on all righty well thank you for the i appreciate the opportunity very very much thank you mr baker all right everybody i hope you all enjoyed tonight's interview with one of the few people i look up to in this field um and i say that not because i think i know anything but i say that because This gentleman has been doing this for years, and he's still as humble as the day he started. Um, A wonderful, wonderful person. I'm honored to call him a friend, and I I hope that you guys may have gotten a couple of little puzzle pieces from this interview. With that, thank you for supporting this channel. Thank you for all your well wishes. Guys, please stay safe, happy, healthy. And ever vigilant, please keeping an eye on your pets, your children, your loved ones while enjoying the summer in the woods. These creatures are out there. They are real. 
God bless you all.